but I do need to show that we can try to decompose threshold reads for more complicated thresholds uh, into simpler ones. So let's try that. Um, so here, what I have is the example that I had for doing AND, the very simple threshold read that we, we talked about. And I'm going to try and turn it into very simpler still threshold reads against basic promises. So I have, I want three Boolean promises. Um, and what I'm going to do is, to model this, I'm going to model it by spinning up three threads. So I, I'll have par fork off a couple of background threads and the whatever, whatever it's doing in the, in the foreground. And it will say, um, the first thread will try to do a threshold read on this variable. And whenever it triggers true, it'll come over here, do a threshold read. If this triggers true, it'll scribble out true. The second thread will do a threshold read here. And if this triggers is false, scribble false directly. And the third thread will say, do a threshold read here. If this triggers false, scribble false. All right? These things will be woken up. Only one of these will be woken up. Um, or will blow up the world because we found a contradiction. And what we now have is sort of the, um, a simple par network of, of threshold reads that will emulate this sort of hybrid, more complicated threshold read. But now as I'm moving up here, the thing that was blocking on the true side of the, of the equation isn't, um, uh, isn't waking up constantly. So we actually do less waking because we're dealing with simpler reads. Um, and similarly, if I was trying to model like a set where I can add members to the set and I union sets to move up in the lattice or I intersect to move down in the, or to move up in a different lattice, you can have addition sets or subtraction sets. Um, then I can have a, I could, I could view that as, build that as, out of a map where I, I put, I'm looking for whether, when Bob gets put in this set, I'm not looking for every introduction to the, every mem addition of a member to the set and then hoping that it's Bob. It's just trying to, to make the construction less coarse grained. And out of everything that I've done here, I think this makes the biggest difference in how well things perform is just, it, it, if we say that LVARs are a good unifying abstraction, the trick is picking the right grain size for those LVARs, making them, really making them as fine grained as possible. So now that I have this, and I've spent all this time talking about how to implement something, I should actually talk about why we care. Um, so I have a few application domains that have come across um, my desk over the last several years that I've tried working on um, that all fit into this space. Um, we've talked about promises, uh, SAT solving, so trying to figure out, give me a, a, a Boolean assignment to some formula that actually makes it pass, uh, data log, which is how to do um, table stuff in a way that doesn't suck. Uh, convergent replicated data types for distributed programming pop up. Uh, constraint programming, you know, x is less than x is in a range, y is in a range, x is less than five. Find me a set of assignments that you know can solve this Sudoku problem or whatever. Um, unification is a lattice. We can actually view um, information about type variables propagate as propagators. Um, interval arithmetic. We can say that we start with the interval from minus infinity to infinity. That's my bottom. I don't know anything about the value. The top is the empty, the empty interval, right? The things covered by top are with points. Um, you can't really draw the Haas diagram because there's nothing. You can't put two real numbers next to each other. Um, but it uh, does form a lattice. It does not have an ascending chain condition. This means that if you have a cycle in a graph that involves um, real number computations, and intervals, um, you can have something like, let me compute a newton raphson approximation to a function, and it will iterate over and over and over again and get closer and closer and closer to an answer. So we have no reason to believe that this will terminate. Um, if you're using doubles, now you actually do have a reason to believe. But if you're using reals, you're not, or rationals, you're not. Um, integer linear programming. So we can do linear programming, turns out to form a lattice when we get done phrasing it correctly. We can actually do integer linear programming with a, a par-based driver. We can generalize that to cone programming, which lets us work in all sorts of crazy spaces. Um, this stuff works with both constraint programming and all the integer linear programming stuff, sharing variables. They're convex theories. 
So you can actually use the, all of these features actually can live in the same space, do, working on the same problem at the same time. Right? They're all just different lattices and different kinds of propagators between them. Um, functional reactive programming actually uh, makes a, a, it rears its head in the um, original paper on this topic actually. Um, and it has a nice spin on FRP, which is that my, nor my normal complaint about FRP is that it's causal. That if I say that x equals y plus z, that's not a symmetric sort of relationship. It's telling me which one tells me which. Um, and we can write equational propagators that say addition is a monotone function. If my inputs are both defined, my output is defined. Um, and I can lift arbitrary functions that same way. So we can also say that, well, given the output and one of the inputs, I can tell you the other input. So we can run addition backwards as a propagator network. It's not, unfortunately, while the answer that we can give you, especially if you start doing intervals with it, will um, be sound, it'll, it'll give you an interval that contains the answer, it won't necessarily give you the tightest such interval. Um, because you can actually show that like, if you're gonna compute x plus x, you'll believe that you have two unknowns, and yeah, it gets messy. Um, uh, probabilistic programming is tackled in the original paper. Provenance tracking is tackled in the original paper, but in a way that um, turns something that should be EXP time into EXP space. Um, I gave a talk at Boston Haskell that went deeper into that particular side of the, of the, of the space about how to fix that. Um, incremental programming, there's uh, nominal adapt on. You can steal all the machinery that makes that go to actually make it so that you can name the propagators, uh, the cells that you're adding. Um, Connell Elliott has something called unamb, which is sort of how to write lazier functions. Like, I want to do an and that's lazy in both arguments. Well, as soon as I can run that par computation as a, you know, par, uh, for all s, par s a arrow a, and I have the ability to um, read from a, um, an IVAR as a pure computation, we now have the ability to write lazier functions. So what I want to do now, with whatever time I have left, is uh, talk about how to transfer results from those different domains to each other. So I want to take the things that made SAT solving fast, for instance, and use it to make all of my other problem domains fast. And um, back around 2001, uh, like Chaff, I think, was the, the first real modern SAT solver that came around. Does anybody here know much about SAT solvers? Okay, nobody. Crickets. Okay, one, two people. Um, so the, the two things that made SAT solvers go fast were that we learned that we can do conflict-directed clause learning, which is to say, we found a problem. Let's add more things to my problem. Uh, let's, so like we said that, uh, oh, um, as I was going through trying to find a satisfying assignment of variables, um, I needed to learn something new. And there's something I'll call a two-watch literal scheme. So a SAT problem is going to be basically, I need this and this and this to be true. And I need to pick assignments to the variables x, y, and z, and w here that would make this um, clause tell me true. So find me a satisfying assignment. Or prove to me that it can't exist. Okay. And the way that you typically do this is if it's a form of propagation. We would do something like, if I only have one element, in one literal in the clause, then I can tell you what its answer must be. I can just read it off, right? If every one of these things must be true and one of them only has x, then I can tell you x must be true. If one of them had not x, then I can tell you x must be false. If the clause is empty, it's not satisfiable and I have to backtrack. Otherwise, I guess. I pick one of the variables in one of my clauses, I say, hey, x is true. And then take every clause that had x occurring positively and just say that clause is solved. X is true or something else, and I don't care. What else? This is done. And the thing that I had not X in, I have to go through and kind of cover it up. It's not that thing. And then hopefully, covering that thing up gets me down to either a unit clause or causes me to backtrack. When we backtrack, we figure out a small clause that we can add to our environment that will make sure that we never fall into the same trap again. This is sort of the, exact, the, the core execution strategy of a SAT solver. The problem is, is that when one of these clauses has like 500 elements, every time I 
change one of the variables that just happens to lie in there, I'm looking at this uh, cell again, and I'm firing, uh, I'm trying to propagate information out of it. And it's not going to do unit propagation until we're down to exactly one thing left. But we're waking up on any one of 500 things being updated. So we're waking up too often, which is a fairly universal problem in our propagator world. If we had a propagator that had 500 inputs, whenever any one of those inputs moved up, even if that can't affect the output, we're going to wake up and try and scan all 500 of our input, and then we're going to go back to sleep. <coughs> so what I want to do is work smarter. And here we have the condition that the only time we ever propagate is when there's exactly one element left. And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch two elements, any two elements that do not have a valid, uh, do, have not had a value assigned to them. I don't know if it's true or false. It's, it's currently bottom. So if I watch any two elements, then, and I only wake up to remove something from the set, effectively, to check to see if we're in uni doing unit propagation, when we touch one of those two, I skim through looking for, am I down to one element, or I find a counterexample, and then I just start watching that one instead. And when I backtrack and say, oh, well, actually, x is false, so it didn't work, let's try and do a different clause, then I don't have to rejigger this, because in a world where less th fewer things are defined, they're still in a legal position. So this, like, this got rid of almost all the backtracking inside of a SAT solver. OK. So now, what I'm interested in is that many of my propagators have this property that if any of their inputs are bottom, then the output is bottom. If I have a monotone function, I'm adding intervals, right? And one of the intervals is minus infinity to infinity, and I'm adding it to another interval. I don't care what the other interval is. I know that the output range is going to be minus infinity to infinity. I didn't narrow myself at all. <coughs> um, so what I want to do is use the same two watch literal scheme to say watch two, liter two things that I happen to know are currently bottom, and when either one of those move up, then we scan through the inputs looking for something that's not bottom, et cetera. So we, we adapt the exact same thing that made SAT solvers fast to do fewer wake-ups to start up my propagator. And then the second thing we need to do is to figure out how to remove a propagator from the network. Right? It's, it would be nice to be able to garbage collect these things. Um, Lindsay has a paper where she talks about freezing, making sure that nothing can actually, no par computation can actually affect the value and then you can let it go to sleep. And then you can actually see the actual value. Um, here, what I'm going to do is this. If every value is just below the top element, where if I were to cause this value to go up, I'm going to blow up the world, not do something, right? Then this propagator can never fire again. So remember, this covered by is that there's nothing between me and the top in this case. So if every input to my propagator can't go up without causing horrible catastrophe, then this propagator can never fire. So now if we go back to um, sat, we started with, I don't know anything about the variable. Oh, it's true. Well, when it's true, it's covered by top. So that's why sat doesn't have to stay awake after it's made a variable assignment. Um, so the combination of these two things is why SAT works. And by stealing them independently, I can use them in a more general setting. Um, another example, uh, really quickly, is this notion of constraint programming. And in constraint programming, what we're going to do is we're going to say something like, I have x is a number between 1 and 5 in their integers, and y is a number between 1 and 5. And then I can build a propagator here that is x is less than or equal to y. And this is a propagator that reads from both x and y and writes to both x and y. So we can build it as a propagator that says read from x and y and write to y, and read from x and y and write to x, or really only have to need from, read from x and write to y and read from y and write to x. But what we're going to do is here, we'll first establish our consistency. Oh, I'm sorry, let's do x is less than y. If x is less than y, then now we can tell you that x cannot be 5 and y cannot be 2. That's our kind of initial starting point, and then we can keep refining from there. Whenever I gain information about x, I'll be able to propagate that to gain information about y. And what we'll do is we'll proceed the same way that we proceeded with sat. We'll, we'll propagate all the things that we can do to make sure that all the individual constraints are satisfied, at least individually, and then we'll start guessing and backtrack as needed. 
Okay, so it's the exact same algorithm as, as for SAT, just um, we're using this sort of arc consistency thing. And there's a classic algorithm called AC3 from the 70s, which is the thing that's usually taught for constraint programming. And if you work it out, it's exactly the propagator solution. We have a queue of what, we're going to, what, of what propagators we're working with. We set up our initial conditions for all the unary relations, and then we just pump the propagator queue. So you can read the propagator algorithm from the 70s. Um, and again, unit propagation was a special case. Another example that kind of leaps out at me is data log. So in data log, data log is like bottom up prolog, where my little atoms or whatever are going to be um, tables, basically. I have a parent table and an ancestor table here. And I'm saying, if x is a parent of y, then x is an ancestor of y. And I'm saying, if x is an ancestor of y, and um, y is a parent uh, ancestor of z, oops, um, then x is an ancestor of z, right? And so I might have a bunch of like starting facts, and then this thing gives me a bunch of rules that I can iterate on until it reaches a fixed point. So now my data log statements here, these rules are my propagators, and these tables are my cells. And I gain information by adding rows to tables. Right, which is unioning two tables. So <laughs> data log is not executed by that horrible, horrible scheme that I just described. At the very least, we move up from naive evaluation of data log, which is doing join after join after join after join, to doing slightly smaller joins. And one of the things that we can do is we can sit here and if we number our rules, we can build a graph that says, hey, look, the parent table feeds into this rule and then we feed out into the ancestor table. And then the parent and the ancestors feed into rule two, and then they feed out into the ancestor table. And if we topologically sort this graph, it will tell me that I should feed all the parents into the ancestor table. And then I should run this strongly connected component until it stops. So what that's saying is, dump this into there, and then cycle this over and over again. And then we can try and work even smarter we can say, um, let me just look at the deltas, the new ancestors, because those are the only things that we actually have to join against the parent table. The old ancestors, we already joined and merged. So the delta, the new delta, and plus one actually, um, is driven by the old delta joined with the parent table. So now if this is only four new entries and this is a million items, we're not joining a five million item table against a one million item table to find five more things to do the next round. Um, and this notion of building these deltas is actually something that we can do in general. And I'm going to skip through this because um, it's now been shown on slides. <laughs> and people can catch it in the, in, uh, on the backswing. Um, and that notion of topological ordering of the graph can actually be used as well. So executing my propagator network in whatever the current known topological ordering is actually a very good thing. But adding, when we had conflict-directed clause learning, we were adding new nodes to our propagator network. Our, our propagator network was dynamically growing itself. So this now means that the topological ordering that we just stole now needs to be dynamic. And that actually has some pretty terrible time bounds. Um, and I've been working on finding, I don't need to build a perfect topological ordering. I only need one that's pretty good. And I do believe at this point in time that there's some kind of small k, k optimal solution, which uses some like 2x multiple of the optimal number of steps. I don't have a proof for that one yet. Um, but there's other things that we steal in data log. Data log has this ability to say, and there's not some, there, and there is no ancestor of this, or there's not this in this table. And these edges in data log are special. They're not allowed to participate in any cycles. But in the propagator network, we could say that we could add these sort of special kind of propagator edges, and they can be non-monotone functions. They're just not allowed to participate in any cycles. The monotonicity was what, what enabled us to uh, participate in cycles, to have our propagator network feed forward and backwards and have nothing ever go wrong. So if we start relaxing this, we can get some interesting pieces. But for me, I think the most telling reason why data log is an interesting problem domain 
is that the, um, Joe Hellerstein, who is the guy, one of the, one of the people who um, helped build up uh, PostgreSQL, and he's been a big data log advocate ever since, um, stated this, th something he called the calm conjecture as part of the Berkeley Orders of Magnitude project. And in it, basically what he said is that a program that has an eventually consistent coordination-free execution strategy, it can only have that if it's expressible in data log, in proper monotonic data log. Okay, so what that means is <laughs> that the only algorithms, <laughs> if, if this conjecture is true, which it has some pretty strong evidence for, um, the only algorithms that we can implement that are eventually consistent and don't require some sort of Paxos or vector clock organization scheme to try and make them go are precisely the ones that we can express in data log. And we've already established that we can express all my data log problems in my propagator network. So if I'm looking for a, an argument for why this is a good universal construction for eventual consistent programs that don't have crazy coordination schemes, um, that conjecture from Hellerstein goes a really long way towards arguing um, that we should care. So we learned a bunch of things from Datalog, um, and I'm pretty sure I'm basically out of time here, so I have just one or two more slides. <laughs> um, which is that uh, these convergent replicated data types fit into this model. Commutative replicated data types can be made to fit into it with those relaxations I talked about earlier. Um, using those threshold reads, let us rederive all the work that happened on unamp, and that makes it so that every one of these propagator solutions that we can build up don't get buried in a par monad, but they can just look like more pure functions. They let us write, every function in Haskell is monotone, um, but they let us write more of those monotone functions that are not expressible. They're, they let us write things that are admissible under that requirement, but that are not directly expressible under the language that we have. So, that is what I have. Thank you.